and the, the structure of your book is uh, addressed to your students uh, at Howard. Uh, the decision to choose that form for your book? You know, I was, to be honest with you, I've not said this anywhere, I was very worried about that. <laughs> because I'd done that, like I'd written this letter in Between the World and Me, and I thought people could get, oh my God, he's gonna do this again, what, Between the World and Me, again. But the fact of the matter is I am always trying to achieve intimacy with the reader. That's, that's the, you know, the, the, the primary job. I, you know, I would tell my students all the time, look, you are dealing with readers who could be doing anything else. They could be on their smartphones. They could be playing video games. They could be watching movies. They could be watching TV, be somewhere making love. They could be doing anything but reading you. And so you have a responsibility to make them feel a sense of intimacy and immediacy. And I was lucky in the sense that, you know, these were very, very real conversations that I'd had with my students, so I had something to pull from, you know? And also, you know, the, the, the fact of just, the letter form allowed me to do that. It allows me to get, you know, a kind of intimacy with my reader. Talk about George Orwell, why I write, and oh, um, connecting politics and language in the promise you made to your students at Howard. Your, Between the World and Me was written to your son, Samari, yeah. this to the students. Yeah. So we usually start, actually, with politics in the English language. That's, that's, that's the first essay that I have them read, you know, just to think about language as a political thing. You know, we, we live in this world where um, I feel that um, oftentimes we are taught, not that everybody subscribes to this, that art lives over here and politics lives over here. And that politics itself is actually very, very limited, that, you know, it happens every two or four years. It's in the voting booth. It's who you decide, you know, to vote for. It's what issues you decide to activate on. But one of the arguments that I make in the message is that there's an entire architecture outside of the world of mean politics that determines how politicians actually talk, the choices they give, you know, et cetera. Why does Kamala Harris feel the need, for instance, to say that she has a gun? What, what is that actually based on? And I would say it is based on archetypes of femininity. I would say it's built based on archetypes of race, archetypes of the cowboy. And where do those archetypes come from? They come from our art, they come from our literature, they come from our film, our TVs, our commercials. You know, and at their base, they ultimately come from writing because somebody has to write those ultimately. And in that world, things that seem separated from politics never really are. And so I wanted to start that, that uh, book, um, or this book, The Message, with that Orwell quote, because that, that's like one of the things he kind of is obsessing with in that essay. And at the same time, there's this beautiful tension that I often feel, which is in a different world, you know, he would just write beautiful stories. He would just play with language for the hell of playing with language. But he doesn't live in that world. And I don't feel that my students live in that world. They live in a world of, of as we'll talk about, genocide, apartheid, segregation, global warming, you know, category five hurricanes, you know, flood on one coast, fire on the other. These are immediate issues. And I, I don't believe that they as writers, we as writers, have the luxury of sort of sitting back in our salons and in our living rooms, you know, simply constructing beautiful language for the hell of constructing beautiful language. It has to be engaged with something. Has you, from Sega, you take us to Columbia, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, why that choice? Well, I was writing this in a time where this um, wave of book bannings was happening. Um, and I always wanted to write about that. But I, I felt that I was worried about making the writer the center of, of the book banning. Because even though the, the work is directed at the writer, the writer is actually not the person that suffers under the book ban. The teachers suffer under the book, under the book ban. It's the teachers who are under threat for losing their job. It's the teachers who get harassed. It's the librarians who are under threat of losing their jobs. It's the librarians who get harassed. It's the students who lose the ability to have access to different worlds and different ways of thinking. And I was trying to figure out how I could write this in such a way um, so that I would not be the center of it. Luckily, you know, I ended up in conversation with a teacher by the name of Mary Wood uh, from Chapin, South Carolina, went to Chapin High School where she teaches um, and where she was trying to teach between the world and me um, and got into some amount of trouble for that. Um, and she invited me down, you know, just to, you know, go to a hearing. Um, and that's what I did. And um, it, was quite, it was quite eventful. It was not the world that I expected. It was not the, um, the audience I expected. Um, it was interesting to see uh, how much support actually was rallied behind her, even though she's in a deep red area, uh, in a deep red state. Um, 
And so that too is about the power of stories. That too is about the power of narratives, the questions we ask and the questions we don't. You write in the message about this experience in mm -hmm. South Carolina, I see politicians in Colorado and Tennessee and South Carolina moving against my own work, tossing books I've authored out of libraries, banning them from classes. I feel snatched out of the present and dropped into an age of pitchforks and book-burning bonfires. My first instinct is to laugh, but then I remember that American history is filled with men and women who right. were as lethal as they were ridiculous. Right. Now, if you got you, one running for president right now, you know, <laughs> lethal and ridiculous. Well, you talk about um, the area you were in, 70-30 split, 70 percent for mm -hmm. Trump, and yet, mm -hmm. and this is what you were just talking about, this 30 yeah. percent, how surprised you were by the minority, the power of it when it's mobilized. Yeah, you know, it's like one of these things, like, again, like, this goes back to how we construct language. It's either a blue or red district, right? Even purple doesn't quite, like, carry the quite, you know, like, the real context. So you think it's red, uh, okay, battle's over, why am I here? You know, but 30%, and 30% activated around an actual issue is actually a lot of people, you know what I mean? And, and it was like, like, I could not have known that without seeing it. Like, you have to, and this is like one of the messages I have, you know, for my students in the book. You, you have to walk the land. You can't, you know, sit on your butt reading reports, you know what I mean? And even reading books like this one and say, hey, I'm gonna be a writer. You have to have actual experiences. So I have to walk in that room, you know, and meet this, you know, white woman in her 70s, you know, who tells me in the wake of George Floyd, we organized a reading group at our church for black authors. And I love Colson Whitehead. Oh my God, have you read him? You know, like I have to have that experience with somebody. You know, I have to have that, that shock, you know? Um, and so I, I, I just feel like it was like really, really important in, 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 in the message to actually model the work that I was articulating or model the lessons that I was actually articulating for my students. When you just referred to President Trump, can you elaborate further? Um, he looks ridiculous, but he is in fact quite lethal. You know, um, and I think uh, certainly in 2016, uh, there was great, great temptation to laugh. You know what I mean? Um, you hear these things, you know, you hear him say certain things, you know, you see him, you know, in certain places, and there, there's a kind of dismissiveness. Um, but what we actually are dismissing is a kind of darkness that I think lurks deep, deep within all of us and can actually be appealed to. It's not um, comfortable to say that you can win through hate. It's not comfortable to say that you can win through anger. It's not comfortable to say, historically, it actually has been very effective at, you know, uh, electorally, to pick out weak people or people who are not in, you know, the most advantaged political space and to demonize them and use them as a tool, that that actually has been quite effective for people in pursuit of power. We would rather think that um, good wins all the time, that people see the best in each other. It reifies our notions of what America is, our stories that we tell ourselves of what America is, but it doesn't correspond with the actual history and the truth.